I, it's my pleasure if we're all ready and sitting down and ready to go to introduce to you our final but not the least speaker of all that, Stephen Mosher. I have followed uh, his writings and his videos uh, for quite some time, so it's my honor to have him here. Uh, Stephen Mosher is the president of the Population Research Institute uh, from 1995 until now and the author of a number of books on China, including Hegemon, China's Plan to Dominate Asia and the China, and China Misperceived. Uh, American Illusions. That's a long title. That's a long title. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, leave some of his bio behind because I just want to tell you he's an expert on the China's one child policy and on the myth of overpopulation. And it's just a, a very, very big reason pro aborts use for, for having um, abortion is because we are overpopulated, we're all going to die of starvation because there's too many of us in the world. And uh, that's one reason I'm very excited to have Stephen here. And I would ask you to welcome our final speaker, Stephen Mosier. Okay. Good afternoon. Well, I appreciate uh, that kind introduction. I came yesterday afternoon from, uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, unfortunately, I arrived without my luggage. <laughs> so I can tell from the groans in the audience you've all had that experience. <laughs> For some reason, it seems beyond the capability of the airlines to get a bag from point A to point B. One airline employee said, well, look at the bright side. We did get you from point A to point B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I conceded the point. I finally did get my, my, uh, my other bag this afternoon, but uh, as you can see, I'm still in my travel clothes. I'll go home in these clothes tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll be all packed for my next trip next week. So, you know, it's, it, all, <laughs> it all works out somehow. Uh, I do a lot of these trips, as, uh, as you can understand, to different parts of the world. And uh, most of the places in the world I go to now are, uh, are actually... Uh, close to or actually losing population, which is an interesting twist on what a lot of people have been telling us for decades, and that is that we have a population explosion. It turns out that, that in many places in the world, we now have the opposite. We have a population implosion. And if there's a population implosion, then, of course, the solution to the population implosion is, uh, is of course, not population controlled, not abortion, but, but, uh, but pronatal policies encouraging the birth of babies. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, the coming demographic winter uh, that's already upon, upon parts of the world, and then uh, go from there, take you on a quick tour around the world, uh, some places I've been and some places I'm going. And then I'm going to end by showing some, some uh, educational videos we've been doing, uh, YouTube videos, to illustrate that there aren't too many people on the planet, uh, there isn't a shortage of food, et cetera, et cetera. All the, 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 uh, the arguments used by the opposition uh, to convince people to be barren and decrease in number turn out to be false. So let's go to the, the aging and dying of the world's population. Of course, before a country like Japan begins to actually lose population, and Japan now has been losing population since about 2002, it ages. Aging precedes dying. So that's what I mean by the aging and dying of the world's population. And one sad thing about the recent disaster to hit Japan is that the population of, of Japan now is, is so elderly that it's going to be hard for them to rebuild the country. Japan went down the road of abortion and population control uh, almost before any other country. In 1949, they legalized abortion under eugenics law. By 1964, the birth rate had fallen below 2.1 children, and it's been well below 2.1 since 1964. Right now, the Japanese are averaging about 1.2 children. And it doesn't take long at 1.2 children for your population to decline and fall. Japan will lose 50 million people before the end of this century. Now, some of you may remember uh, when this book came out. It was called The Population Bomb by my former colleague at, at, at Stanford University, Paul Ehrlich. Uh, Dr. Ehrlich is still there. 
I was asked to leave <laughs> for reasons I'll get to in a minute, but for reasons that had something to do with the myth of overpopulation. That's one of the reasons that they, Stanford and I, parted ways. The first sentence of this book uh, goes like this, I believe. The battle to feed humanity is over. Hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in the 1970s. Well, that's a testable proposition, isn't it? <laughs> Hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in the 1970s. Well, those of us who lived through the 1970s, as I did, know that hundreds of millions of people did not starve to death in the 1970s. Instead, we had Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution, which increased crop production all over the world, increased grain yields per hectare, per acre, beyond, any, beyond anyone's wildest imaginings 50 years before. And places like India, which had been importers of grain, went in the 1970s, late 1970s, 80s, to being exporters of grain. Uh, India was the place where some of those hundreds of millions uh, that uh, Dr. Early thought were going to die uh, did not, did not. But there were deaths in the world. There were deaths in the 1960s. There were deaths uh, from famine in China from 1960 to 1962. And some people on the other side of this issue say, well, doesn't that prove that there is a food shortage? No. It does prove another thing, however. It proves that when Chairman Mao forced all of the Chinese villagers into the so-called People's Commune, and when he then said, by the way, besides planting grain, you're going to be building backyard steel smelters so that we can catch up to Great Britain in steel production within three years. And by the way, I have these other roads and dams and everything I want you to build, so don't stay in the, the fields too long. Don't bother harvesting all your grain because we're now living in a people's republic and no one will ever starve. Well, because of his machinations, because of his mismanagement of the economy from 1958 to 1960, because he forbid people to eat in their own kitchens, even going so far as to take their walks away from them and force them to eat in the communal kitchen, which was fine until the communal kitchen ran out of food. Because of all these things, from 1960 to 1962, uh, about 42 and a half million people died in China. It was a famine, but it wasn't caused by a food shortage per se. The peasants would have tightened their belts and managed to get through somehow, but Mao Zedong sent the army out in the countryside to collect the last stores of hidden grain by the peasants because he wanted to make sure the army was well fed. You see, if you're a communist dictator and the villagers are dying by the millions, it doesn't really matter, but if your army colonels and generals and privates and sergeants get too upset with you, uh, they might find a new dictator. So he took the last grain away from starving peasants and let them die. So the worst famine of the 20th century was a man-made famine. It wasn't because of overpopulation at all. I had to read this book four times, <laughs> believe it or not, in, in, uh, in college in different classes. Then I had to read it again when I wrote my own book, Population Control, just to remind myself of how bad it really was. Now, you would think that someone who had made such a, 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 uh, a failed prediction would humbly apologize for his mistake. After all, these are professors supposed to be engaged in the dispassionate search for truth and reason. Well, uh, apparently Dr. Ehrlich didn't get that message because in the 1970s, after his prediction failed to come true, he went on to write another book. I don't have a picture of the cover of that one. It was called The Population Explosion. Same idea, right? Except now, hundreds of millions of people were not going to starve to death in the 1970s because the 1970s were already past. And you can't make up things about the past because people will catch you on it. So he made up more things about the future. He said hundreds of millions of people will die of starvation in the 1980s because of the population explosion. That didn't happen either. So he went on to write other books. But you get the idea. You would think that he would admit that he had been wrong doesn't he learn from his experience? Well, his first book sold four million copies. He was getting tens of thousands of dollars per lecture uh, at his, uh, on his lecture circuit, and he was on Johnny Carson 47 times. And so he did learn a lesson, I think. He learned the lesson that if you tell enough scary stories, you become rich and famous. And that lesson apparently stuck. So 
Uh, but enough about, I don't want to be picking on Professor Ehrlich. I could, I could mention a number of people on the other side of this issue who believe that we absolutely have to have abortion and sterilization and contraception massive programs because of overpopulation. And I'm here to tell you that overpopulation is one of the myths uh, of the 20th century. And that our real problem now, the problem that we see increasingly in country after country is depopulation. Now, I didn't know this when I went to China in 1979. When I went to China in 1979, I knew what I had been learning at Stanford University, which was that, yes, there was a population problem and that China was in the grip of uh, a massive problem, a problem of overpopul overpopulation. I also thought, hadn't thought really about the question of abortion. I, I decided uh, early on as a young man that that was a woman's issue and I was content to leave it in their hands. Um, there's a certain amount of self-interest in that finding, of course. Um, <laughs> So I was selected in 1979. Uh, we normalized diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. Uh, and I was the first American social scientist allowed into China. There were other scientists allowed into China. China was happy to have nuclear physicists and chemical engineers and so forth in the country. They were willing to accept historians because they were studying ancient history. They didn't want anything to do with my research because I was interested in finding out if life under communism was better or worse than it had been before. And so they turned down my research proposal. It was only after uh, former President Jimmy Carter brought up the matter with China's senior leader, Deng Xiaoping, that uh, I was given the go ahead to do my research. Now that had certain advantages. You see, when the, the, the number one leader in a one party dictatorship says that this person is a friend of China and tells local officials that they are to cooperate fully with his research, what happens? Everybody follows orders. And so when the one-child policy began, I learned about the one-child policy about the same time that local officials did. I know that because on March 8th of 1980, a local official came over to my house waving a government document, and he said, we just received this, and I thought you'd like to see it. Well, I, I wanted to see all the government documents I could get my hands on. So I read it, and it was the beginning of the one-child policy. It said that in Guangdong province, which is down south, uh, near those large letters I was here, near Hong Kong and southern China, they declared there were too many people in Guangdong province and that the population could not be allowed to increase more than 1% in 1980. More than 1% in 1980. So I thought about this for a second, and I said to Secretary uh, He, who was the secretary of the local Chinese Communist Party, I said, that's, uh, that's uh, an interesting goal. You realize it's March of 1980 and that all of the babies who are going to be born in 1980 have already been conceived. He said, that's no problem. We're going to do a house-to-house -house search of the village. We're going to identify all the women who are pregnant. And then we're going to decide who's going to be allowed to continue their pregnancy and who's going to be asked to get an abortion. Well, women who are pregnant with their first child were allowed to continue their pregnancy, a few women with their second, but most of the women who were pregnant in the village were told that they were carrying illegal children, illegal children. They were stunned by this news, of course, because when they had conceived these children three months before March of 1980 or six months before or even nine months before, it had been legal to have second and third children. Now, all of a sudden, their unborn children are being declared by the state to be, to be illegal and the state was determined to eliminate them. So they, these women were arrested. The ones who didn't go in for abortions right away were arrested, charged with the crime of being pregnant, taken to a local government detention center, held there, uh, given morning to night uh, propaganda sessions, study sessions, uh, brainwashing sessions, we should call them. And at the end of the day, they were taken under escort to the local medical clinic, which for the next few weeks did nothing but abortions. Woe to those who became ill with pneumonia or anything else. They would not be treated. This was an abortion clinic for that high tide of population control. And so all these women were forcibly aborted. I went with them. Local officials were not happy that I was there. You can imagine. But I went with these women as they were arrested. I went with them as they were locked up and told they would not be released until they, they submitted to an abortion. I went with them as they went crying to the the local abortion clinic. I was there when they were given poison shots uh, into the uterus. Um, 
and I was there as they performed abortions. Uh, the local officials didn't want me there, but after all, Deng Xiaoping had given me permission to be there. So uh, this picture actually dates from the time. I, as I mentioned, I was the first American social scientist to, allowed to do research in the PRC. I spoke the local dialect of Cantonese already, but it took me some time to learn to tuck in my shirts. <laughs> uh, not to tuck in my shirts, rather, not to tuck in my shirts. Um, you know, there were people everywhere in the Pearl River Delta, one of the most densely populated rural areas on Earth. You can look at crowds and you can say, wow, there are so many people. Maybe there is a population problem. There wasn't. There was another problem, too much government. And then when I went with these women, uh, after they were arrested for the crime of being pregnant, they were given lethal injections into the, the, the uterus. And, and the injection was given directly into the unborn child. These women were mostly five, uh, seven, nine months pregnant. Uh, the ones, the real holdouts, and you'll understand why, the, the women who did not want to submit to an abortion, who fought to the bitter end, were those who were past the point of quickening. They'd felt their babies move. They knew they were carrying uh, a son or daughter, and, and they tried desperately to, to protect their, their children, um, and they failed. They were, they were all aborted at the end of the day. They were first given a lethal injection. The lethal injection was intended to kill their unborn child, and, uh, and then... Um, <coughs> And then, in some cases, they were then given a follow-up cesarean section abortion to remove the now dead baby from their body. 32 years later, after that horror, uh, the horror of the one-child policy still continues in China. Uh, I was just in China last year. You ask, why would they let a spy like me back in the country? Well, the answer is they haven't. You know, they've turned down my request for a visa on many occasions. Uh, this time I, I got a new passport, and for occupation I put down farmer. <laughs> now, it turns out that we don't have to get into the, 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 the moral question surrounding that answer because I, I do have a farm in the Shenandoah Valley, and I raise Angus beef cattle and children. Um, <laughs> but nine children, by the way. More cattle than children, but yeah. So, so I put down farmer, and they gave me a visa, so I was able to go in and, and talk to people about the one-child policy. It's still very much in place today, and the abuses that I've been talking about are still happening in China today, 32 years later. Uh, that sign translated means conscientiously carry out planned births, ensure perfect families. Um, yeah, and also ensure perfect births, because there is a, uh, another slogan that says we want perfect children. And so that's why so many of the children in China's orphanages, if they're not girls who are abandoned because of their sex, uh, they're little boys and girls with, uh, with handicaps. Uh, you can be, uh, children are abandoned in China uh, for the most minor uh, of handicaps. You can be abandoned for having a facial blemish. The government has been saying for 30 years, we only want perfect children, limiting everybody to one or in the countryside, two children. And so the pressure to have a perfect child is enormous and children who are regarded as less than perfect wind up uh, in, in, uh, in orphanages if they're lucky. If they're not lucky, they wind up dead. So in the name of stopping China's overpopulation problem, the Beijing regime has eliminated 400 million of the most productive people on earth from their population. Okay? Beijing brags about this. The Chinese government actually said recently that its contribution to, glo to stopping global warming was that it had eliminated 400 million people from its population. And we don't want to go into global warming. I've, I've written about global warming before. Uh, the Earth's temperature has been cycling for a long time before we got here and will continue cycling a long time after we abandon the internal combustion engine. Uh, but. Um, for Beijing to think that they have somehow done themselves and the world a favor by eliminating 400 million of the most productive, enterprising, uh, entrepreneurially minded people the world has ever seen is nonsense. You see, they made themselves poor. And I can say that uh, because we've actually crunched the numbers. We've actually looked at the present future value of a baby born in China. And what I mean by present future value is you 
you take, as in the case of buying any asset, you take the cost of the asset and then you factor in the benefits you'll receive down the road. It does take 18, 20 years to raise a child to adulthood, but then that child enters the workforce and is a productive member of society, producing more than they consume for the next 50 years. And the present future value of a baby born in China is several thousand dollars. So the Chinese government can congratulate itself on eliminating several trillion dollars from its economy by eliminating 400 million people. The same math applies to the United States, of course, only you add a couple zeros because a baby in the United States will contribute if you make some calculations about uh, future economic growth, about a half million dollars more to the economy over his or her lifetime than they will consume. So every abortion is the death of a small fortune in the United States as well. It puts the whole question of abortion in a different perspective for those who don't share our faith, for those who only think in dollars and cents terms, it's a good argument to use. Back to China, the total fertility rate is one and a half children per woman. Well, why not one? Well, because the one child policy has been imposed in the cities uh, for the last 32 years. In the countryside, however, in 1986, they relaxed it a little bit so that if your first child is a girl, you can have a second child. If your first child in the countryside is a boy, you're supposed to stop at one. But if your first child is a girl, you're allowed another chance to have a boy. That was intended to stop, to stop female infanticide. It did not stop female infanticide. In fact, there are still baby girls being killed before birth in China today by sex-selective abortion. There are still babies being killed after birth uh, by infanticide. In fact, in, in parts of China, they keep a bucket of water by the birthing bed. And this bucket of water has two names, depending on the sex of the child that's delivered. If the child that's delivered is a little boy, it's called the washing the root bucket because the root refers to the lineage of the line. The line is being continued. The clan name is being carried on, so you're washing the root. Uh, it's a happy term. If the baby, when it appears, is a little girl, the bucket of water is called the, the washing away the trouble bucket because you plunge the little girl into the bucket of water before she has a chance to draw her first breath and drown her. Anyway, the total fertility rate is one and a half children per, per woman because of the one slash two child policy. China's population will peak in 2025 and begin to fall China's population is aging more rapidly than any population in history. And just let me say one more thing about China. For some years now, China has had a labor shortage. The coastal provinces have had to, to, to go into the hinterland of China, into the backwater of China, and recruit workers and bring them to work in these coastal factories that produce uh, uh, goods for export primarily to the United States and Europe. But now that source of labor has dried up. China in 2014, a couple of years down the road, will have a nas national labor shortage. That's why we will see inflation in China and wages in China rising because there are too few workers uh, for the jobs now that are open. So what has the one-child policy done? Well, first of all, it's a massive human rights violation. You've, you've forced uh, hundreds of millions of women to have abortions. You've sterilized them consequently. Didn't show you that picture, but after every abortion, a sterilization is done. Unless the abortion is on a young unmarried woman, she's allowed to keep her fertility uh, because there are no single uh, mothers in China. You cannot get permission to have a child if you're not married. So they don't sterilize those girls. They can go on to marry and have their one child, but sterilizations are performed routinely uh, on women. And of course, there's coercion. So it's forced abortion, forced sterilization. Then we have the problem of female infanticide, which is, which the Chinese government will say, well, that's just a holdover of a feudal practice. The Chinese villagers don't know any better. They traditionally have, have valued sons more than daughters and have put some daughters to death. Well, in large parts of China, that wasn't true. People could afford to raise all their sons and daughters. But those same people in those same areas now put little girls to death because of the one-child policy. Because if they allow a little girl to live, then that little girl takes up a quota that they will then not be able to use to have a son. And so it's the one-child policy in China. 
It's, it's India's population control program that has resulted in the fact that uh, there are 100 million more men uh, than women in China, tens of millions of more men in India uh, than women, all because of population control programs skewing uh, the sex ratio. And of course, we have the after effects of abortion on Chinese women principally. Uh, China's unique at, in, in having the highest suicide rate in the world. And it's unique in another way as well because most of the suicides in China are committed by women. This is very unusual. In, in, in other countries, in fact, everywhere else in the world that I know of, uh, men commit more suicides than women. In China, it's the reverse. Why? Because so many women have been subjected to forced abortions. And even though it's not their fault, even though the government has taken over control of their reproductive system, even though they may have been taken by force to the abortion clinic, being mothers, they still blame themselves for what happened, for not being able to protect their children. There are already 117 million people 65 and older. Um, I'm very worried about what is going to happen to the vast and growing number of elderly in China. One can imagine another population control program, not directed at the very young, not, not directed at the very young, the innocent unborn and their mothers, but directed at the elderly. Euthanasia is already being practiced on a significant scale. The population bomb has fizzled in China. The elder bomb is about to explode. So this is true for China. We've uh, spent some time talking about China, but it isn't... Uh, but is it true for the rest of the world? I mean, isn't the world's population approaching 7 billion? Yes. Late this year, early next year, we will pass 7 billion people on the planet. We will have 7 billion people alive at the same time for the first time in human history. We'll talk about whether or not that's something we should celebrate or despair over. Another question, aren't the populations of many countries still growing rapidly? Well, the last time I looked at the world population clock, which was a few weeks ago, uh, the population of the world, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, was 6,903,522,743. So we will pass 7 billion sometime early next year. We will pass 7 billion people, and lifespans have never been as long. People have never eaten as well worldwide and never enjoyed uh, the good health that they do today, on average worldwide. So it doesn't seem to me that passing 7 billion is something we should, uh, we should bemoan. It's something we should celebrate. It's a great victory over death. Of course, there are a lot of people who are alarmed by this number, but what they should know is the world's population is not exploding. Uh, we've all seen charts like this. It makes it look like the world's population is exploding. It makes it look like the world's population is going Asymptotic, it's just, we're just going to, to reach tens and tens of billions of people and, and pretty soon we'll be shoulder to shoulder throughout all the, the land masses of the planet. Uh, this graph is, which appears still in social science and, and uh, biology textbooks in high schools across the country, is, is absolutely not true. We did have a one-time population doubling that we should talk about for a minute from 19... 50 to 2,000, we went from 3 billion to 6 billion. And people look at that and say, well, you know, if you continue that line on upward, where are you going to be in, in a few generations? Well, that is a one-time doubling for a reason. The reason we had a one-time doubling was because of the advent of modern medical care in the developing world. After World War II, we started spending a lot of money on foreign aid, and we reduced the infant and child mortality rate in Latin America, Asia, and Africa significantly. And as we reduce the number of children and babies dying, parents started having fewer children. That's what we call the demographic transition. Death rates go down first and then birth rates follow. At the end of the day, you have low death, you start at high death rates and high birth rates, and you end up at low birth rates, low death rates. This chart here represents a one-time doubling of the world's population because it's not that people started breeding like rabbits. Birth rates were falling throughout this period of time, but they stopped dying like flies. Death rates went down. The lifespan at 1950 worldwide was in the high 30s, 38, 38 years of age on average. 
lifespans in 2000 were over 65. So we almost doubled the human lifespan. And if you double the lifespan, naturally you're going to have more people around, right? You double the human lifespan, you're going to have double the number of people. That's what we did. This represents a great victory over death. What's going to happen now is population will level off at 2040. This should be the chart that all students learn. It's not. Hopefully it will be soon because all indications are the world's population is going to level off around 8 billion, give or take a few hundred million, depending on the fertility decisions of your children and grandchildren. And then it's going to decline. That's our future. It's not a future of a world becoming ever more populated. It's a world where countries, nations are becoming depopulated. In fact, this comes from um, the United Nations Population Division, which is not the United Nations Population Fund. The United Nations Population Fund is a group devoted to promoting population control, abortion, sterilization, contraception around the world. The United Nations Population Division is a small group of demographers who are trying to get the numbers right. And the only line that matters here is the lowest one, which shows population peaking at around 2040 and then declining. We can ignore the other ones because the other ones assume that birth rates in Europe, for example, now at about 1.3 children, are magically going to go up to 1.85. No reason given. It assumes that there's something magical in other countries about the 2.1 replacement rate fertility. We've heard a lot about zero population growth. There's nothing magical about zero population growth, 2.1 children. We always thought, a lot of people always thought that, well, people will start to uh, have fewer and fewer children, they will stop at two, they'll replace themselves. Well, Europe and Japan and, and Taiwan, Korea, Singapore passed 2.0 and kept on going. There appears to be no limit, there's no bottoming out of, uh, of birth rates around the world. Once you become a captive of a secular, humanist, materialistic lifestyle, um, the tendency is to reject marriage and childbearing altogether. Total fertility around two point, uh, two, 2005. Uh, the dark blue are nations that are dying uh, already. The lighter blue are nations that are below replacement but, but struggling along. The, uh, the, the yellow are nations that are slightly above replacement and the red are nations that are significantly above replacement. Uh, I should get a newer chart than this because the numbers have been falling even further since, uh, since this chart was made in, in 2005. Because Latin America is now uh, mostly at or below replacement. Mexico, uh, I was talking to the head of the, uh, the Mexican uh, Population Commission a couple of years ago, and she told me that they were below replacement rate fertility and now uh, only averaging about 2.0 children. I said, aren't you done? You know, you've had a population control program in place for decades. Can't you fold up your tents and go home? She said, oh, no, we have to get the birth rate down even further. So they're continuing to drive down the birth rate. So there's no country in Latin America which now has a robust uh, fertility rate. Uh, in fact, most of the countries there in yellow are, now should be in light blue. Uh, the only part of the world that really has a fairly high birth rate is Africa. But Africa has other problems. Africa has AIDS. Africa has malaria, typhus, typhoid, all these tropical diseases. Africa has very high infant and child mortality rates. And so I tell the population controllers, you want to go into Africa and you want to abort women and sterilize women. And what you should be doing is you should be providing primary health care so that their children survive because if their children survive and you're interested in lowering the birth rate, if their children survive, then, then they will naturally decide to have fewer children. It, it's worked that way everywhere else in the world. But they're, they're, they're bent on, um, on, on uh, aborting, pushing abortion everywhere. Um, look at some countries, uh, Latin America on the left-hand side. I know that some people's eyes glaze over when they see columns and numbers, so I'll make this brief. But uh, Costa Rica, 1.69. That's what, remember, replacement is 2.1. Peru, the, um, uh, one of the poorest countries in, in Latin America, 2.1. That's replacement. Peru was a country where a few years ago they had a sterilization campaign where they sterilized 300,000 women, requiring them to come in for the operation, threatening them with the withdrawal of medical care for their children if they didn't show up on time for their appointed uh, tubal ligation. 
Uh, that occurred in the late years of the Clinton administration, um, which was very pleased by it. Mexico, uh, 1.8 now, latest numbers. Brazil, uh, 1.45. Ecuador, 2.13. So you see that's Latin America. So um, those are all Catholic countries, by the way. Those are all Christian countries. They're part of, uh, of, 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 of what we used to call historic Christendom. And, and I must tell you that, that, that Catholic countries, Christian countries, have, have received a, a, a preponderance of the uh, attention from the population controllers. They seem to have a particular interest in, in forcing down the birth rate in, 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 in these countries. Right now, they're attacking the Philippines. Look in the right-hand column. The Philippines uh, averaging 2.6 children. The population controllers say that is too high, and our own Agency for International Development is trying to push a two-child policy on the Philippines. If the bill passes, and it's being considered right now in the Philippine Congress, third children would not get, say, scholarships to college. Uh, there would be other government benefits that would be withdrawn. We wouldn't see China's program, uh, you know, a full-blooded uh, population control program involving forced sterilization in the Philippines, but we would see government, the government used as a means of forcing the birth rate down. India, 2.27 children. Malaysia 2.1. Most of Asia is uh, some of the Asian countries, the developed ones are well below replacement. South Korea, Japan have an absolute demographic crisis. Japan we already talked about. Japan doesn't like immigrants very much. It's an insular country. I lived there for several years. And, uh, and yet they've got their share now of illegal immigrants. They really can hardly uh, keep them out because otherwise some of the factories would shut down. Uh, and we thought 30, 40 years ago, that countries would have to reach a Western standard of living before the birth rate fell. We know that's not true now. We know that even very poor countries like Peru, uh, all they, they, don't, they don't have to reach a Western standard of living. They just have to, to, to see uh, infant and, and, uh, and, and uh, child mortality rates drop far enough, and the birth rate follows. The Middle East, the, the, the Muslim world is a mixed picture. And this may surprise some people. There are still countries where the birth rate is still high, as in Afghanistan, averaging six children, where marriage is universal and occurs when a girl is in her mid-teens. But look at Turkey. The Turkish prime minister just uh, said in a speech a few years ago, he said everybody needs to have three children, one for the father, one for the mother, and one for the state. Uh, Tunisia, 1.57, they just had uh, a, a peaceful, relatively peaceful revolution. Egypt, 2.45, Iran. The mullahs took over in Iran, uh, the Ayatollahs took over in Iran in 1979, you remember, they drove out the Shah, captured our embassy personnel. Uh, the day that President Reagan was sworn, in, sworn into office, they released the embassy personnel, just in time. Um, but the mullahs ruined the economy. You see, it, it turns out they didn't know much about running a modern economy or the importance of international trade. And after they ruined the economy, the population controllers went in and said, well, well, it's not your fault for the fact the economy is doing so badly. It's not your fault that you have, none of you have degrees in economics. It's not your fault that you don't understand international trade and investment. It's the fault of your people because they're having too many children. And the Ayatollah said, yes, yes, I believe that's true. So now in the mosques, they preach sterilization. And, uh, and uh, that's why Iran now is averaging 1.5 children. So they have their own version of, uh, of a one, two child policy but think of how convenient it is for a third world dictator, be he uh, Deng Xiaoping in, in the People's Republic of China or the Ayatollah who, who rules Iran or some dictator in, uh, in the Middle East or Africa. And you go in, you're from the UN Population Fund or you're from the United States Agency for International Development or from the World Bank. And you say, you know, Mr. Dictator, your country has many problems. And we're going to help you alleviate those problems. We're going to give you large sums of money. Uh, and the dictator says, well, what are my problems? And you, you, t you don't tell him what his real problems are. His real problems are that he's corrupt, that he's got a Swiss bank account, that his officials are on the take, that he doesn't understand economics, that he hasn't built the schools and the roads and the infrastructure that the country needs to prosper. You tell him that those aren't his problems. You tell him his real problem is that his people are having too many children. Well, how convenient it is for a dictator to have an excuse to shift the blame from his own failings to the people, right? 
it's not my fault. It's not the fault that my officials are corrupt or that I'm on the take or that I don't, don't understand economics. It's, it's the fault of you people having too many babies. And then the World Bank official says, well, now that you've admitted that, that your people are a problem, let us help you design a population control program. And so they design a two-child policy for you. Uh, they fund uh, sterilization clinics. They promote the legalization of abortion, which uh, just happened in Kenya, by the way, over the wishes of the Kenyan people, I think, uh, who really didn't know what was going on. And they take your, your medical clinics which were in the business of treating malaria and typh typhoid and typhus and AIDS and turned them into to so-called reproductive health clinics or family planning clinics, which are really population control clinics. And so the whole direction of the medical care establishment is redirected away from primary health care into population control programs to sterilize, abort, and contracept the greatest number of women. What happens when you do that? Well, what happens when you do that is you get massive human rights abuses, number one. It's not just China. We've seen them in India in Indonesia a few years ago. Women were taken in by gunpoint by the military for their sterilizations. We've seen it in Mexico where even today a Mexican woman goes into a government hospital to give birth. She's asked whether she wants a temporary or permanent method. The temporary method is an IUD. The permanent method is tubal ligation, and, and she can't say no. Lots of abuses there. So we've documented abuses in 44 different countries. But it's not just the human rights abuses. What happens when you take doctors and nurses out of the business of treating infectious disease? Well, you get more infectious disease. There's no one to treat the malaria victims. There's no one to treat the uh, victims of uh, pneumonia and typhus and typhoid. And so you get what the, ec the economists call an opportunity cost, the opportunity cost of taking your best doctors and nurses out of primary health care and putting them into population control is that people die unnecessarily of diseases that are treatable. Malarial tablets cost pennies a day. And as the death rate goes up, as it is going up still in some African countries, how do parents respond? Well, they say, you know, my children may not make it to adulthood, so I'm going to have to have more children. And then the population controllers say, we need to double our efforts because we're still not driving down the birth rate enough. You see, they're working at cross purposes to themselves. When parents see a large percentage of their children dying in infancy and childhood, they have more children. To reduce the birth rate, first reduce the death rate. This is so widely understood in demography that we have a name for it, the demographic transition. I'm not saying we want to reduce the birth rate. I want more people, not fewer. But this is the... This is the argument that we have to use uh, on, the, on the other side, the people who don't understand the blessing of children. Young people are the ultimate resource. In many parts of the world, they're becoming scarce. I took advantage of the fact that this is my PowerPoint presentation <laughs> to put in a picture of my children. This is Thomas Aquinas Mosier holding his youngest sibling, Kiara Faith Ann Mosier. So, So I, I realize when, when, I, um, when I advocate you know, pronatal policies in Europe and, and, and Russia, as I'm going to do in a few weeks, I'm going to Moscow, um, it upsets some people who still believe in the, one of the myths of the 20th century that the world is overpopulated, but it's not. I recall being uh, in the halls of Congress a few years ago. I was, I was trying to, uh, I was lobbying for, for cutting funding to Planned Parenthood, to cutting fu funding to International Planned Parenthood Federation, to cutting funding for population control programs in general. Take the money and put it into primary health care, I said. Well, I happened to run into a population control enthusiast who was there for the opposite purpose. And uh, <laughs> I, was, I was there with Dr. Stephen Karanja from Kenya. He was there by himself. The population controllers like to operate alone. And... Um, when he found out that Dr. Kranja was from Kenya, he said, you Kenyans are having too many people. And I thought to myself, that's a fine how do you do. <laughs> but Dr. Kranja, being a, an OBGYN, was very calm and patient and, and said, uh, why do you say we have too many people? You have more people in your state of Texas than we have in, this, in the country of Kenya. Kenya is actually larger than Texas. <laughs> and the population controlled enthusiast said, well, because there isn't enough room for the, uh, the lions and the tigers and the hippopotamuses and the elephants. He actually said that. And Dr. Kranja is still calm and patient. You know, I mean, he'd been in delivery rooms with, you know, 
delivering hundreds of babies. He knew how to handle situations like this. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you want us Kenyans to do, to move into the sea? And you could see that the population control enthusiasts thought this was a good idea. <laughs> but as upset as he was with Dr. Cranja, he was absolutely livid with me because when he found out that I had nine children, <laughs> he just, you see, I was, I was a symbol of everything that was wrong in his eyes. And he said to me, he said, you pro-lifers just have all these children so you can dominate the political process. Yes. <laughs> he did. And, and I had to laugh because, you know, I, I said to him in response, you know, when my wife and I are talking about whether or not to welcome another little soul uh, into existence, another little gift from God who will be with us in this life and hopefully in the next as well, well, the last thing we're thinking about is dominating the political process. <laughs> I said, besides, you're not married, are you? He said, no. He was about my age. And you have no children? He said, no. He was from New York City, which may explain everything. <laughs> but, but I said, listen, when, when you get a little older and you have your first heart attack and you call 911, it's going to be one of my children who answers the phone. It's going to be one of my children who di drives the ambulance to pick you up. It's going to be the, my, one of my children or the child of someone who's pro-life who is the paramedic who gets your heart beating again, who does the open heart surgery on you, who takes care of you in the ICU and adds years to your life in consequence. It won't be one of your children, I said, because you don't have any. <laughs> so, see, these people don't think. They don't think about... That, that, that we have to provide for the future in the most fundamental way by providing the future generation. And if you don't provide that future generation, everything is lost. Everything is lost. Two-thirds of the world's population is already below replacement rate fertility. The population of the world is aging rapidly. Smaller family sizes shifting care of the elderly outside the home. Um, in Japan, they're making robots now. There's so many elderly people who have no families no children, no grandchildren, that they're making little grandchild-like robots. And they look like little tiny children. And they're programmed to ask, to carry on simple conversations like they say in Japanese, Grandpa, why is the sky blue? Or Grandma, why, why do birds fly? And so these elderly Japanese can pretend for a moment that they have real grandchildren, when in fact they don't. You can rent a family in Japan, too. The elderly Japanese sometimes rent families on weekends, a father, mother, and two young children, just to pretend that, that they have children and grandchildren. But then, of course, 72 hours later, the rented family goes home, and they're left alone. So it's very sad, uh, these countries that are aging and dying. The world needs babies now more than ever, because our long-term problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not too many children, it's too few children. And it's our job to populate the world. As far as I know, the first commandment given to our first parents, be fruitful and multiply, has never been rescinded. <laughs> now, we, 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 uh, so one of the things we do at, at Population Research Institute is we produce short two-minute YouTube videos for educational purposes. And, and these videos have gotten uh, hundreds of thousands of views. I think we're over a million now. And I would like to just take a couple minutes to show you these. They're great educational tools. Can we go to um, POP 101? The myth of overpopulation originated in England in 1798, when a vicar named Thomas Malthus, who fancied himself something of a mathematician, saw that food production increased incrementally, but people reproduced exponentially. He sat down and did some simple math, and summarily decided that the world would be out of food by 1890. He blamed reduced mortality rates, and recommended killing off the have-nots of society, lest the haves starve to death. This cry was taken up by Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University in 1968, who claimed that reckless human reproduction had overwhelmed the Earth. Massive famines would result, which would destroy, best case scenario, one-fifth of humanity by the end of the 70s. And the planet would follow. This fear produced large donations for the newly created UNFPA, which thrives on an imagined crisis that has been both imminent and rescheduled again and again over the past two centuries. The truth of the matter is that every family on this planet could have a house with a yard and all live together on a landmass the size of Texas. 
which is really just a small corner of the planet. The population of Earth will peak in 30 years and then start to go back down. We're not overpopulated. Do the math. are on our website. I, I've got uh, two, two very clever young men, graduates of Christendom College in, in Front Royal Virginia, who do these for me, and, uh, and, and we're, getting a lot of, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of positive responses, and we get a lot of hate mail, too. <laughs> I don't read it. I have Colin Mason, who works for me, go through it and just delete all the, uh, the bad words. Um, <laughs> But we can win this argument if we just if we stick to the facts. The facts are on our side. Let's go to the second one. From the time of the cavemen all the way until today, humanity continues to exist because each generation of people has produced another generation to replace itself. Scientists have figured out how many people need to be born each generation to replace the generation before. That number is one person per person. All things being equal, this creates perfect demographic balance. Since women are the only ones who can have children, replacing every person on Earth means each woman needs to have two children, one to replace her, and the other to replace the man, who cannot have children. The total fertility rate is the average number of children each woman in a society is having. This number shows us if a society is growing or shrinking. In developed countries, the replacement rate birth rate is 2.1 children per woman. This will keep the population stable, but even that is assuming that every woman has children, and that there are no wars, famines, or disease. In the real world, disasters happen all the time, and sadly not all children reach adulthood, especially in poor countries. This pushes their replacement rate up to 3.3 children per woman. Since not every woman wants to have children, in order to keep the population stable, some women need to have more than 2.1 children to balance the birth rate with the women who are only having one, or no children at all. Maintaining this balance is of the utmost importance. If society does not at least replace itself every generation, human numbers begin to fall exponentially. Economic and social problems appear, as elderly people retiring begin to outnumber young people entering the workplace. This is already happening all over the developed world. Many of the world's nations are only barely replacing themselves, while a growing majority have birth rates below replacement, some as low as 1.8 or even 1.2 babies per woman. Many societies are facing a very real danger. Extinction. So I think that speaks for itself. Um, and, and we've been able to reach a lot of people with these. Let's see, we've got one about, we've got one more about food, I think. According to believers in overpopulation, there are so many of us on the planet that food production cannot possibly keep up. However, according to both the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Food Program, there is currently enough food on the planet for everyone to be well fed. Not only that, but we're growing this food on less land than we did in the past. This is why in the United States, for example, the government can afford to pay farmers not to grow food, but instead return their farmland to the wild. Modern technology also allows us to grow food on land where it would have been impossible to do so, even a few years ago. Agricultural experts even believe that Africa, if cultivated using modern farming methods, could eventually feed the whole world, all by itself. Then why are people in many parts of the world starving? The World Food Program lists key causes of hunger, and overpopulation is not on that list. War, one of the leading causes of world hunger, destroys crops and disrupts relief efforts. Widespread poverty prevents many from buying the food that they need, and a lack of infrastructure means that there isn't a reliable way to transport food to areas that need it. This is why reducing the number of hungry people will not make the remaining people less hungry. Those who have access to the food will continue to have access to it, and those who don't will still be hungry. Reducing population will not magically cause food to be spread around equally. And blaming overpopulation for everything does nothing but distract us from the real problems that we actually have. Think about it.
So anybody you know who's uh, still laboring under the myth of overpopulation needs to see these videos. They're, they're on our website at pop.org, P-O-P.org, pop short for Population Research Institute. So let me end here, and, um, and I, I don't know if we have time for uh, questions. Okay, I'll be, I'll be outside at my table if anybody has some questions prompted by the presentation. I'll, I'll stick around to answer all of them. Thank you.